So I'm going to go ahead and call our best practice and innovation subcommittee of the OEIB uh, together to start. Um, first, we, I'd like to just welcome everybody here, let you know that we actually have one major uh, discussion item on the agenda. We are trying to uh, use the format of this meeting in a different way than the OEIB meetings, hoping that we get more discussion um, amongst the members of the committee as well as staff, as well as others that we might invite to the table, either as invited testimony or members who are here. Um, Dr. Crew, would you like to make any opening comments before we jump into oh, discussion? No. no, I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. So I would like to ask uh, Colin Cameron from COSA to join us. We don't have it on the agenda as invited testimony. My view of some of the work we've been doing is working really quickly. Uh, people have been uh, doing work really almost on the fly, almost on the drive here. Um, early as we were forming this committee, um, when Margie was support and we were trying to figure out what direction we might uh, need to go with the achievement compacts in terms of landing on uh, recommendations from this subcommittee to go to the OEIB, uh, we realized that there were still some questions hanging out there about trajectories. And we had a white paper submitted by some superintendents. Uh, we had others putting together some ideas. And in the meantime, um, OSBA, COSA, and OEA joined together on some recommendations, brought, us, brought those to us. And so, but what still remained was the finer detail information. So I did reach out and ask Colin if he would convene a committee that included uh, data people, uh, people from instruction, as well as members from OEIB and members from ODE to see what that group might uh, offer us in terms of guidance around the trajectory uh, after they had a chance to look at the recommendations that had already come forward to us. So what we've also asked Colin to do, when I looked back to see what documents we put in front of you today, we realized that there had been several different versions of recommendations around achievement compacts for K-12 public schools coming to us. And so just to compile all that and have it uh, together, Colin was uh, willing to do that for us. So Colin, if you would start from where we were on those recommendations and link us to what the work your committee has done would be great. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Curtis. Uh, Colin Cameron with COSA. Um, uh, this is a, a pleasure to work on this project. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, Yvonne uh, requested that we pull together a group, and this is like my this is my my uh, passion. Before I, I came to COSA, I was, I was curriculum assessment instruction for 15 years in the Mendel School District, and so I kind of miss getting into the data uh, and, and and the trajectory. So. This was, this was great for me. You know, we pulled together a, a group, uh, like Yvonne said, that, that is composed of, of some superintendents, Steve Jupe and Tony Mann from uh, Scafoos and Malala. And then, and then uh, some folks who aren't here, uh, Tim Billy from, from Gresham Barlow. And uh, we have uh, John Bridges to my right, is, is from Beaverton School District, and Drew Braun and, uh, from Bethel School District. And Bill Stewart, or excuse me, um, Bill Stewart from Gladstone School District, and uh, we each have a little part of the of the presentation that, that we're going to do. And uh, a couple months ago, when we were asked to, to do this, it was it was uh, requested. Let's just pull some practitioners together and say every one of these people on the committee have formed uh, achievement compact district committees in their district, and they've, they've worked uh, up to a certain point with, with their compact group, and they, there's questions that are being asked, you know, that committee, what do we do next, and do we, are we doing this right, and, and all these kind of things. So what you'll see in this report uh, is uh, their reflection of what needs to be, uh, needs to be in place to really make a, a pre-K through uh, college Achievement compact, real viable and, and useful for the next uh, several years. So, as, as we're looking at 
in this, it really gets down to some goal setting and trajectories, and that's what Iran asks: is how do we set the trajectories? What are some good recommendations? And, and uh, so that's that's what the law we're going to talk about. We've we've looked over the documents in this uh, salmon-colored uh, piece, which I'll also digitize and I'll send it out so you have a digital copy. But time only really allows us to get the hard copy of, of a, a lot of these. So. Uh, we reviewed these and we worked with uh, Margie, uh, we worked with Josh Klein from our DB and data, and it kind of got us to, to where we where we are right now in the report that, that you're going to hear. So I want I want um, uh, John and Drew to go through and talk a little bit about what what do these committees need? What will committees need to really uh, allow them to, to look at that data and to, to project and to also reflect after after year one, year two, year three, what's a consistent process for that? And uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, John and Drew. Thank you. John Bridges, Beaverton School District. <clears throat> well, as Colin mentioned, we came together to talk about how do we provide guidance to districts that move them forward in the achievement compacts towards the state's goal of 40-40-20. And in the white paper that is in your packet, there were a couple of districts that came together at the behest of superintendents, um, Portland, St. Kaiser, Eugene, and Beaverton. And this is the document's recommendations for setting achievement compact targets. We struggled with, as data people, how do we make sure that we get there? How do we make sure that our kids are prepared and we contribute to the state's goal of 40-40-20. So after a lot of thinking, we anchored on the 100% completion rate target. So in 2021, we want every student to complete high school. We knew where we started with that data, and we looked at a straight line trajectory to get there. So districts that were farthest from that 100% had a steeper trajectory. Those that were closer had a shorter trajectory. And that applied for all students as well as any um, subgroups that districts were setting their goals for. Then we applied that factor to all of the college and career readiness measures. So four-year graduation rate, um, nine-plus college credits while in high school, and then uh, entering college. We fixed the goalposts at 2021. We thought the five-year graduation rate, or five-year completion rate, needed to be 100% in 2021 if we were going to get to the other 40-40 piece of the state goal by 2025. So when we hand our students off to higher education, they've got time to work with those students and have them help complete their four-year or two-year degree. We proposed that same trajectory measure of uh, uh, going forward for all districts using the 2011-12 data as a baseline. Uh, we would recommend that districts be provided with uh, an additional set of information, and that's the state average. So we envision a target setting process each year by the Achievement Compact Advisory Committees, where they would have some sort of graphic representation of based on the 11-12 data, what is the trajectory? So we've got these annual goals to get to the goal post. What is the district's performance relative to that goal each year? So are they on track to be above and get to that goal post quicker, or are they falling behind, both with all students and with their subgroups? And then what is the state average? Because that's an important indicator as well for districts to kind of self-assess and see if the state trend line is moving like this, and I'm lagging, then what do I need to do locally to, to make improvements and get uh, to that goalpost in 2021 of 100% college completion? I mean, 100% high school completion. Good. Drew Braun, Bethel School District. Um, piggybacking on to the, the data that John talked about is the timing and the use of the data for us. Um, Currently, when we set the compacts this past year, we were working in May and early June, and we were really using data from the previous school year. Uh, so your data is really almost a year out of date, and it's not the data that schools are using currently 
we're looking at what they're doing right now. Uh, so our recommendation would be to be more in line with how schools are really looking at and analyzing the data by waiting until the fall when we have the actual results from the previous school year uh, to validate our targets and, and our goals. I think most districts have pretty well to where we know where we are in the spring for planning purposes, but for actually monitoring the progress, I think it would be more beneficial to be in sync with the data that districts are looking at at the time in the fall. So our recommendation then is to uh, move the reporting from or the, the achievement compact target setting from June, July to no later than November, um, and schools can then work with more current data, and when they make their report to their the board with their advisory committee, then their data will be the most recent data available at that time. So that's our second recommendation uh, to the group. My name is Bill Stewart. I represent Gladstone School District, and I appreciate having the opportunity to talk with you today. First of all, uh, let me tell you that personally, I really appreciate the the ingenuity with which the original set of measures was crafted, because it brought up, it forced us to look at things that we haven't really looked at before in a way we haven't looked at before, which is incredibly uncomfortable. So, uh, you know, we all learn from that. And one of the things that one of the themes that I think has emerged in my mind and our minds as we talk through this is the the importance of the three C's in looking at the measures that we're going to track based on trajectory that John and Drew talked about: consistency, continuity over time, and clarity of definition, so that we're all looking at the same thing, how it changes over time, and that we we do it in a way that we can out on a comparison of data from 11, 12, being somewhat comparable to what happens in 17, 18, and 2021, and so on. Um, and, and I think that I, I want to reinforce what John and Drew said in terms of you know, the 2021 goal that we believe K-12 ought to shoot for. We think it's really important that we do a really good job of setting the table for our post-secondary partners to have the best shot at meeting their portion of the goal by 2025. And if we say that we're going to shoot for a later time than that, that puts a challenge at, it, at everybody's feet that is simply doesn't seem to be credible. We'd like to suggest uh, some additions and some changes to the list of measures that are used. And you can see that in front of you. Um, one of the things that, that I think there's a lot of interest and concern about at, uh, at the district level around the state is the initial inclusion of language about uh, including kindergarten readiness as part of a goal setting. And because of the process, the point in the process that we're in developing the uh, KRA, what we're hoping that we would, would be willing to consider is that we start tracking for the first couple of years targets for districts in terms of participation. We really don't have that baseline number that says a 42 is kindergarten ready. And until we have some history there, uh, setting a goal is, uh, along that line seems to be a challenge. But making sure that we're having as many kids as possible participate and getting clarity around the compulsory or voluntary nature of the KRA would really help districts a lot. We also felt like uh, the inclusion of uh, initially of, of reading and math as measures was, was certainly great. We'd like to see some continuity in measure from elementary school to middle school. And you've already got a measure in high school. We see it disguised as a graduation rate since the essential skills component really helps measure that. So, uh, so our recommendations is you would be to add fifth grade math move, excuse me, move math to fifth grade in elementary school, and then add an eighth grade math component as a checkpoint for accumulated skills. Keep third grade reading at third grade, and add a sixth grade reading component, because reading is such, a, is such an important 
entry level skill that we really think that would be beneficial for uh, measurement in, in middle school. And then, of course, we obviously have the, uh, the essential skills in high school. Tracking attendance is, is great. We're quite interested in, uh, in separating attendance and credits as on-track measures. We were, we were a little uncomfortable with having only one compound measure amongst all the things that we were looking at. And we feel like districts would be better able to track and impact the results that they see in attendance and, uh, and on track in terms of credits impl uh, implications with kids if they're, if they're tracked separately. And just so that you know, we're, we're all across the board in our group and those that aren't here about whether six credits is the right answer or seven credits or 37 credits as an end of a ninth grader simply because there are so many different schedules out there in high schools that um, that allow kids to get, you know, in, in, my, in my district, uh, we just moved from a block schedule with eight, peer, eight credits per year to a trimester school of seven and a half per year. If students are only getting six, we consider them not on track. But in a different schedule and a different system, six credits would be. So I think six is the base because it works toward the, the state basic requirements, and that's, a, that's an appropriate number. But I'm going to be handy in my district when I review that data based on the opportunities that kids have. At least that's my plan. Um, and college credit graduation, we think that's great because we all encourage kids to move along as rapidly as possible. The, the concern that a lot of data folks had last year was they just needed more clarity about what counted and what's the, what's the time at which those credits can apply. For example, some opportunities that kids have really aren't transcripted until the student enrolls in the fall. And so, you know, do you want us to count those or, or not? So we just want some clarity there about what you want, because we think it's a great measure. Um, for your graduation rate, clearly an essential thing. And because having three graduation-related or completion-related measures seemed to be more than we felt was necessary to track to give us the same information. We'd encourage simply to rely then on, on the five-year completion rate because that pulls in the other kids, the five-year graduates, the five-year completers, kids that have modified diplomas, that have, have other essential things that will fit under the 20 as we understand the definition of that 20. Bill, I've sat in the meetings and watched the hands go up on whether Superintendents support a four or a five year, and it's pretty much split, split right down the middle. And here you, you mentioned five year completer, five year graduation, but on your other sheet it says a four year graduation. I'm, I'm looking at the two docs here. So this was the first one that came to us, and so this is there's a sort of the next step. Okay, we've evolved a little bit. Are you saying then right here that your group has consistency on a four year graduation rate? That's what we're saying. Really? My intent. Okay. And as long as you, as long as the five-year completer rate is with it. Okay. I mean, as long as we're keeping track of both. Both. But not five-year graduation. Okay. And I, personally, uh, the five-year completer rate seems to me to incorporate the five-year graduation and the other, and, and simply leave us with one less thing to track. You know, we still have those kids accounted for. Okay. That may not be good logic, but it's Bill's logic. We also did talk about districts that are really encouraging their kids to stay for five years and do some of the college credit before they graduate in that fifth year or fourth and fifth year. Could do five-year graduation rate as a local measure. I just, deliver. Oh, I'm sorry, just I've heard so many conversations on, on demographics and how students, especially second language learners in the fifth year, and that districts are demonstrating success in a five-year model rather than a four-year, and that's the reason it was put in there in the first place. 
And so I'm, I'm surprised that there's any kind of consensus on that four and five year. But what I'm hearing from you, Bill, is you, what you're envisioning is by encompassing it into the five year completer, that satisfies it. That's where you're going with it? Yeah. yeah. And to, to be honest, um, it seemed in our conversations that the five year graduation rate wasn't a lot of value added if we kept the completer in there. So we were tracking an additional data point that really didn't provide us a lot of other information because that was contained in the other. Now, clearly, uh, we're, we're making our feelings known, but we understand that we're not decision makers and that, that it's not our place to make that call. But that's, that's our, our feeling uh, amongst our group. And then the, the last thing um, is kid, the, the opportunity for kids avail themselves of after they are a completer or graduate is pretty important. And the, the enrollment in college measure at the, at the data level, at my level as a, as a district data person, caused some angst. Um, and we're wondering whether enrolling is, is a better measure or whether retention after enrolling is the measure that we're really concerned about. Personally, I know that I have kids that graduate from Gladstone High School that enroll in college, and I would count, but they're not successful. And I would rather shoot for those kids enrolling and being, being successful and staying in school once they approach. And so we're, we'd like to make a transition in that, in that post-secondary uh, post measure. Uh, we think it'd be easier to track I think we'd be able to get good information, and then we'd be able to focus on specific deficiencies that we may be able to identify in our graduates that could then inform our preparation programs, uh, whatever dual credit courses that we offer in-house so that they're better prepared to be successful when they leave. Not just that they leave and enroll, but they leave, enroll, and are successful. So that you look like you wanted to ask a question or say something. Well, I was just kind of curious that that pushes back another whole year for tracking that. And then you've got, when are you going to look at that? Are you going to look at the freshman retention rates into the sophomore year? That's what you're thinking. Okay. Dr. Crew, you look like you wanted to ask um, <coughs> um, I, I've got several questions. So. Um, one has to do with uh, when you were talking about third grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, et cetera, and the content areas um, of reading and math uh, are really sort of where those benchmarks um, focus. I guess the question for me was, and science? Right? I mean, I, at some point in time, if you think ahead, we're going to be in a position where it, it's it's not going to be just that, about necessarily reading the math. Um, we're going to find that we are equally as prone uh, to see large gaps in performance when it comes to other analytical content areas like science. Um, and thus, in my mind, it begs the question of how would the how would that information then fit within the portfolio of, of, of content, you know, grade level specific, specificity um, for purposes of, you know, looking at, looking at performance? I wear a different hat than a district data person. I'm a former uh, chemistry, physics, and biology teacher, mm -hmm. so I get that. Uh, you're right. Um, we didn't consider science, partly because the initial recommendations hadn't set that trajectory for us, mm -hmm. if I can use trajectory in that sense. Uh, but I, I think that as we look at the next generation of science standards being mm -hmm. finalized, implemented, and then we and when we transition to an assessment that reflects those, I think that's where Achievement compacts will continue to evolve. One of the things that we've heard repeatedly, I think originating with you, is that this is an evolving 
This will be an evolving document both within the district and as the circumstances in the state change. So I would, I would be just happy as could be if including science was a, was a reasonable thing. But I think right now, the measures that this would, that would be a really big elevation of science assessment in the state with very little notice. Yeah, no, I'm, I don't hear me as, as suggesting that it needs to be on there with a definitive, you know, sort of target. But I do think our compacts ought to contemplate the universe and the body of work that students are going to be asked to perform in, in, a, in a larger context than just, quote unquote, today's world, right? Today's Understood. snapshot. So I, I would, I mean, when I, when I have an opportunity, one of the things that I would want to talk about would be, well, then sort of let's at least anticipate the next generation and at least put placeholder language that allows for that. So for example, if it's science in 2015, then let's just say science in 2015. If it's civics in 2017, let's put, I mean, but at least let's contemplate the fact that this is a signal, it's a heads up, it's a way of being able to think a little bit about the fact that we are not thinking that these compacts, um, however organic they are, only speak to just these cornerstone uh, content areas, but rather it speaks to the universe of this because really, at the end of the day, this isn't so much about whether or not kids get the right test or they have the right numbers on these metrics. It's really about are they ready for a global world? And Oregon's got to start aiming you know, itself at readiness for a global competitive world. And so to the degree that we can begin to kind of make these say out loud what we intend to do as well as what we are doing, um, in my mind, at least it goes a long way of being able to kind of get us, you know, thinking about and ready for the next generation of compounds. The other area that we looked at and talked about was writing. And yes. that, uh, the fact that we don't have a writing assessment until 11th grade at the present time, our thought was possibly when the Smarter Balance comes out, that right. would be another piece that, that would definitely should be added. Uh, since it is also an essential skill. So we, I think, constrained ourselves more to what is available at the moment, but we totally agree with you in writing these in other areas that we discussed that if we're saying at some point in time we want to add something down the road, and suggest we add writing. And that's why you took it out of the seventh grade writing recommendation from COSA, is because there isn't currently the assessment funded. Well, and, and another one too, Mark, that right now we're in a position where our current assessment options are based on existing standards. And yet a lot of, uh, a lot of districts are making the transition very, very quickly to Common Core. And so we'd be, we'd be teaching one thing and measuring another. And, and if we're going to start measuring that, as Drew said, once smarter balance is in place, then we'll have consistent instruction with consistent assessment. Yes. One other question, too. Um, how many of these indicators do you feel confident that statistically the trajectory supports? All of them? Eight of them? One, let me take a shot at this. Uh, one thing that we, that we were able to look at is, is a, a return on investment uh, calculator that w was rolled out and, and we kind of played with that. I think you guys have probably seen that too. And uh, Bang for the buck, third grade writing is great. It's a great predictor. Or third grade reading, reading. is a great predictor of college success. Also eighth grade math, huge predictor. It moves, it moves uh, kids along and, and that, that's how we ended up there. Another predictor is transitions between elementary, middle, and middle and high school. We have the biggest dip between elementary and middle, that sixth grade year, that ninth grade year. Those are the, those are the leverage years. And if, if we can impact that in the system, we thought we'd be in good shape. That's why you see a, a, a third and a sixth grade and a fifth and an eighth grade. We see those as, as, as linking together the efforts within a district. And you can measure cohort-wise, you can measure... Uh, measure accomplishment within a district over time. It's not just a one-shot measure. So we, look, we looked at that 
at that piece, and we thought it was it was uh, worth worthwhile. Yeah. Good question. I just was curious. Um, so, in your thinking and in your discussion as a group, um, you know, we have a report card, and we're developing a new report card that includes obviously much more um, granular information about student performance. So. Um, these various measures along the, along each of the grades and then the growth between the grades and, um, and other you know possible measures being contemplated um, and how do you so so I always begin to question when we start adding in a lot more indicators that we already have in place in the state into the compact I start to wonder does that diffuse the power of the sort of focused um, you know, focus goal setting and focus policy making around those around those indicators. So I'm just curious, sort of what what the thinking is. Could I make one comment about that? And I think part of it is this feeling of transition. So we started with something. We asked people to uh, make it better because we had some questions and some issues the first round. Um, I know that there's a lot of questions about. Where does that state report card fit? Is it the accountability? Is it going to be very closely aligned? And most of us, I think, sitting at this table probably haven't even looked at what that current report card committee is working on. So I'm just going to say, in the absence of most of us getting a chance to even know what that conversation is right now, I think we, we went from one document to the next document to the de next document in kind of a straight line, which I think responds also to Dr. Cruz, why didn't we consider other things? So I think there can be more possibilities. And it's also part of what's in my mind about the question of, is this our accountability model? So when districts say, I've heard some superintendents say, well, no, I thought it was going to be the report card. And I've heard others say, are you kidding me? The achievement compact's out there. It's, it's also an accountability measure. And so how we reconcile those two documents is still the question. I don't know if you want to add to that. Go ahead, Colin. Yeah, so I'm just curious of the thinking or the recommendation around what is the best use for this tool and if we you know, load it up with indicators. Here's, here's how we thought it. We, we, would, we sat down like we were a, a district uh, compact committee. What, what data do we need? Every piece of data here exists. Every piece of this data exists about August 15th every year. It, it can be pre-populated into, into an Excel spreadsheet or a graph. We're asking for the ones with a single asterisk to be displayed in this three-way graph. You know, your, your actual trend and, and trajectory. And we follow that each year. If, a, if a, a local achievement committee had that data up front and could look at it, it would save a tremendous amount of time and it, I think would allow them to look across their district from, from uh, pre-K through college and see how they're doing. And then to drive decisions and to drive investments within that district to provide, to provide uh, reason for additional local, uh, local compact goals to be set. It wasn't, I don't think that it was enough to just have a third grade reading measure and that's the only reading measure. It wasn't enough to have no academic measure at middle. And, and we needed to clarify some of the high school piece and we wanted to link the college and we wanted to link the KRA to it. So it's, it's from the, from the, just the, the practical need for a district committee to have the data populated in a consistent way year after year. And then we can go to the work of not trying to figure out what the measures are. We know what the measures are consistently. Now let's go to work in the district and, and make a difference and, and, make, and hit the trajectory or achieve the state average or higher at, at this as soon as possible time. So that's why we broadened it to, to, make, uh, to make more very consistent. We don't think it's any more work for anyone. Uh, it is just providing this committee with that base information. Uh, Dr. So I think the other really important conversation here is about regional compacts, which I see on the agenda because to me where this gets really exciting is when you're sitting with your community college, your university, your early intervention, Head Start, Easy Care, uh, Relief Nurseries, and you're really saying how do we create 
you know, really significant partnerships that really leverage, um, you know, leverage the movement along the pathway and all the policy that goes along with it. So, um, I, Whitney, I don't know, is when we talk report card, does that still pay 12 report card as opposed to? Uh, yes. So, it is. Yeah, so I think when, if we put this in the context of regional compacts and that we really need some data points and that what these compacts are really saying is how do you get together as siloed organizations that now become a pathway and how do you work together on behalf of these children and then what are the policies we need to work with you know, through OAIB to make sure that becomes seamless. That's what distinguishes this from a report card for me. So looking at the time, I know we want to have plenty of time for that conversation. I know Dr. Mm -hmm. Kuhn has a lot of ideas about that, and there is an overlap between your new ideas with this current compact. So I was wondering if there were any more. I know you have some recommendations on the back. Did you want to, in the next couple of minutes, make some comments about the rest of those? And then we could transition. You could stay at the sure. table for the conversation with us. Great. Well, let's okay. just look at number four. If you flip back. You know, this is... Uh, this is the one where uh, a local uh, compact committee, I don't think many, many local um, goals were set, uh, priorities were set by in that first round when things were submitted. And uh, all, all we're saying here is it would be great to have uh, some prototypes or some examples of some good goals for local, uh, local measures. That would help that district committee kind of know what's happening. They may want to set it around science and technology. Or may want to may want to look at uh, their their uh, first generation college uh, students uh, attainment. You know, those are samples, but I think people kind of stayed away from those, thinking I don't know really since it's not required, we don't really think we are going to do it. So I think it would it would help us a little bit on that. And this is a really one that's rich to make a unique uh, regional piece here. This is. This is this is a way to help regionalize what what each uh, district is doing geographically throughout the state. Well, I was going to say we did set three local goals, and um, I like how you brought it into um, the the regional context. But on the other hand, what I what at least the way we used to talk about, it, and I know this is evolving, was what is a school district is really your signature piece that you want to be held accountable for. So we did an arts matters, because arts really matters to us in Springfield and the school board. And as a result of that, you know, we've got kind of a cultural trust coming together in a committee. Um, so part of it was for that notion. And then we also had some on ACT, because we use ACT. We think it's a great predictor of college. And um, we really felt we needed to look at that. So. Um, we're happy to share those, but you know, I think to me it's a question of that really helps make a district feel unique. But if it becomes regional, that's a great regional opportunity. I think, I think John wants to talk a little bit about this trajectory reset. This is, I think, it would be great if we if we can acknowledge the possibility of some resets. And, and John has three examples of that. It'd be really. When districts establish that trajectory on the 11-12 data, we really want them to hold fast to that, rather than change, resetting the baseline every year and changing the slope of the trajectory. But we also recognize there's some situations where, as a state, we need to say, okay, you establish this trajectory based on a certain measure, like maybe graduation rate, when there were no essential skills required, and now kids, to graduate, need to demonstrate essential skills in reading, writing, and math. And at some point, those essential skills, the requirements for those may be raised, and they're based on the uh, college readiness benchmarks for the Smarter Balance assessment. So if there was an in, kind of an indication to districts, hold tight until there's a change in the measure, and then you might want to consider resetting your trajectory based on that change in the measure. And then the, the last one, number six, has to do with the number of students in a particular group that we set targets for. Uh, we believe that you still report based upon FERPA, which is if six or more kids you report the data, but setting targets for six students uh, becomes problematic, I think, for districts to, to measure. 
and to say over time we're really making progress or not making progress. Uh, we didn't come to a minimum cell size, but we thought it would be important that uh, this group look at having a, a minimum cell size to set targets or look at other ways such as uh, combining with several years of students to get to a minimum cell size and then you end up with a rolling average to be able to report those. Uh, so again, I know that some things have to happen very fast, uh, but if we can't get to that, our recommendation is that sometime in the near future we get to a size of saying that this is a large enough population that what's being represented there is actually representative of the performance of that particular group and district. So that was our, our last recommendation on that. And then, oh, yeah. the, the, the last thing we'd like to mention is that there's a, our Christmas wish list is here, <laughs> immediate needs. Um, and I'm not sure that they're necessarily in order of priority, but personally I'd say that the, the top one is the most urgent need and that uh, they're, Districts are, are working diligently with their achievement compact committees, but they're really not quite as clear about where their February 1 target needs to be in terms of what you want. And so any sort of clarity that can be communicated in the field would be wonderful. Um, we're pretty darn good at reporting, as long as we kind of have an idea of what the expectation is. Kind of the same thing we say to kids. And so uh, that, you know, that, would, that would be a request, but certainly we'll do our darndest to, uh, to give you the, the best shot that we have of uh, our progress so far in our adjusted trajectories for the remainder of the year uh, on February 1st. And then the other things basically play back to the things we've already talked about. And uh, so hopefully those can be within your uh, time frame for consideration. Is this a Hanukkah with with two or just with us. It's a winter. Thank you. Winter. 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 Thank you very much for um, all the time I know you've spent on this. I also want to appreciate the collaborative na nature. I think that's the most exciting part of all of this work that we've been on this journey for probably about a year and a half is that we keep all coming together. Um, and I think things are just getting clearer and clearer and better and better, and there's certainly more that we can do. I wanted to call out one thing and one hope in terms of an outcome before the end of the meeting before we transition to this idea of a regional compact. I just wanted to, on A on the first page where those recommendations are, I wanted to make sure that everyone on this committee knows at least, it, let me just check my understanding. Right now that kindergarten readiness assessment is not required for school districts to administer by statute, I believe. So having this here as a participation, that makes sense to me, that districts would aspire to want to participate since it's not required by law. Now, ideally, and maybe I just speak for myself, but it seems like if we're going to have a kindergarten readiness measure, we might want to change the statute so that everybody actually gives that kindergarten measure because our kindergarten uh, teachers are doing assessments anyway. I know that this was intended in the thinking about the early childhood piece and having a similar measure as they enter, but then wouldn't we also want to be using that same measure for all the kids who don't attend early childhood to see if we can compare? Did you have information to add to that? Yeah, I believe Rob is exploring um, with the state board adopting this as a rule. It can be adopted as a rule, the mandatory nature of it within mm -hmm. the current legislation. So he's looking at you know, if that makes sense and what what needs to be put into place to make that happen. Great, that's great to know. And the other one that affects that is that there's no requirement for kids to attend school until age seven. So taking a look at that one and saying, you know, here we have this readiness thing and then we have some kids who might not even enter for another two, three years, that's a problem. So I just wanted to call that out because I'm so familiar with that piece. So my hope for um, this committee is that we would get a chance to think about the regional idea 
and maybe come to consensus on some recommendations we might take to o OEIB today, if there's some that we want to hold on to and work on for January. But I know that school districts are waiting for this guidance and have to go to their boards, speaking for even my own. They're just waiting for this guidance, otherwise they sort of already have some information. Um, I think it would help our credibility as an OEIB if we could give that definitive guidance in some way, even if it was only on some of the pieces. So I'd like to turn it over to you, right. Dr. Crew. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the conversation that uh, sort of precedes uh, my comments today is a conversation that uh, came about um, over the course of many months uh, in which uh, I visited a variety of school districts, uh, community colleges, universities, uh, various uh, community-based organizations uh, all around the state, each of which had uh, an interest, if you will, in not just students but very specific performance outcomes of students, many of which were alluded to in the previous uh, presentation. And uh, with them, uh, uh, with those conversations, uh, there it became clear that there was a pattern of interest uh, in this, uh, in a couple of key notions. One was this whole question of uh, mutuality, uh, and not mutuality in the sense that this is about you know what is the state going to do for me and so on and so forth, but really mutuality in the sense that uh, uh, that people really did want to get outside their own silos. They really did want to start working with other uh, institutions and uh, create the kind of dialogue and the sort of more organic conversations that uh, were really requisite for being able to follow and, if you will, uh, you know, sort of track the trend lines of student development and growth over the P20 system. So it was out of that that um, what I did was to begin thinking through the sort of next iteration of this. Obviously, the the conversation about metrics uh, was a was one piece of it, and knowing that you know you and others were knee, knee deep involved in the metric conversation, and so my intent today is not to kind of go through that all over again, but to suggest to you that there is a an ongoing structural um, recommendation, if you will, that relates in this instance to this idea of a um, uh, of a P twenty um, regional compact, and uh, that that um, while I do know and want to say specifically that I'm not prepared today to have the community college and the higher ed conversation as it relates to that, I will allude to the to those institutions, uh, but no particular uh, assumption should be made about their metrics or anything else that I may be saying um, by virtue of uh, of any comment that I'll make regarding that. So the, the notion is that in a regional compact, um, there would be greater mutuality among uh, the participating institutions in the P20 universe. And those participating institutions would include the pre-K hubs, for lack of a better term. Uh, it would include, so their focus, if you will, be um, birth to grade three. Um, and the metrics that we have just talked about obviously are somewhat incomplete as it relates to just the pre-K piece. Maybe there are other elements of that that we want to uh, actually onboard, but for right now, the whole um, kindergarten readiness assessment is at least the benchmark for that, for that, uh, for that um, era. Uh, obviously, the third grade reading is the other. Um, the... Uh, other constituents that would be a part of this uh, regional compact would include ESDs. Um, it would include the um, uh, uh, K-12, if you will, school districts and their respective superintendents slash boards. It would obviously include the uh, community colleges and four-year uh, universities. Um, that really does represent who ought to be in the room when a compact is entered into, if you will. Now, the sense of mutuality is about this notion that people actually have to talk and confer with each other in some agreed-upon time frame and some agreed-upon way that allows for the data to be looked at across institutions. So that the, 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 the antithesis of this, 
has been that everybody does it in their own silo. And that's a little bit of what we have right now. Most of these compacts came up as a result of a lot of information from K-12, and then a lot of information from the community college, and then a lot of information from the higher ed. This contemplates being able for all of those institutions, including the, the uh, early, learner, early learners in ESDs, to ask and answer uniformly how will their work unfold in a way that advances the cause of students in their region moving through their continuum of P20. And to that end, there therefore would be on this new compact or on this regional compact, there would be two levels that I would be asking for. One level would be dedicated specifically to just the metrics themselves. So as we were just talking about this in relation to K-12, um, it would include many of the items and the indicators that, uh, uh, that were just uh, recently referred to. Um, assuming we get all of those right, the next level uh, would then be um, a more narrative format, if you will, that allows for uh, the P20 regional team, if you will, to address unique community and parent and organizational needs that are obvious to that particular region or endemic to that particular region. What I'm learning and, and continue to be amazed at is the uh, incredible difference uh, that exists in various sec sec sectors of the, of the state. So what is a unique problem in one state is not a unique problem in another state. Uh, what are available resources and assets that they have to call upon in one portion of the state may be very different from another portion of the state. How ESDs, how communities, how CBOs, how businesses all play a hand in being able to create an infrastructure for how they would respond to very, identify, very unique, uh, uniquely identified needs in some regions may be very, very different. And yet, I do think it's important for us to capture that as a part of the work of the compact. What has been amazing to me has been the, you know, sort of organic um, nature, really, of a lot of the conversations that, uh, you know, Hilda and I saw in various places around the state where, you know, a community college president is already working with the ESD, is already working with a superintendent or a group of superintendents, and they're already in a... In a, in a sort of a regional, if you will, bond uh, around not just tracking of results, but intervening in student performance that none of them are particularly comfortable with. And so the, the, this compact contemplates essentially a two-level uh, completion. One is level one, if you will, um, you know, what are the uh, uh, specific metrics that apply and how those metrics actually articulate across the P20 uh, world. Secondly, what are the uh, community uh, parental uh, and or other organizational uh, uniquenesses uh, that um, when explained in narrative form uh, would make for a commitment to uh, a long-term or sustainable intervention in unique problems that are uh, for the region. If there's a region that has a unique drug issue, if there's a unique issue connected to um, uh, large numbers of kids who uh, are just recently, have just recently emigrated uh, to the state, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the kinds of things that I would articulate as being uh, some of the unique issues. The second element of this would be uh, that the regionalization would be uh, a function of community college designation. But the idea here that community college presidents and or their respective staffs would ultimately be a way by which uh, we would uh, see this as being, if you will, uh, managed, having the conversation uh, be convened. Um, I've met now with a number of community college uh, presidents, uh, all of whom have you know, uh, really seen the value that they not only provide in relation to workforce and career development, but really, you know, a large number of people who are in the 40-40-20 space who are just recently mint, freshly minted out of, a, out of a continuation high school or out of a regular comprehensive high school or, 
or uh, and so forth. So they're kind of in the middle of this entire hub uh, of of, uh, of education. And so to the degree that we would organize them by community college region and have districts that are associated with them uh, and have uh, early learning centers or hubs that are associated within those community college districts, that would be um, my, my, uh, my, my, my preference. Um, that by comparison to doing it either by ESDs or by comparison to doing it to uh, community colleges, so, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, four-year institutions, um, et cetera. Um, a third element of the regional compact would be that there would be every spring, and I'm thinking that this would be sort of in a uh, June, July uh, time frame, um, probably more July uh, than June, but early summer, late spring, there would be um, a, a community connections conference, for lack of a better term. I'm not sure I'd want to stay with all these C's, but... But I, but I do think that there's got to be a way where this compact asks people to leverage their social capital into the envelope of support as people are trying their, desperate, their best to get as much effort and as much focus and as much resource committed to uh, students uh, as they're going through the B20 system. The purpose of this conference really would be to connect the dots that, that typically don't get connected. The community-based social service agencies, uh, the cultural organizations, the art organizations, the foundations, the philanthropics, uh, lots of people have been dotting the landscape with an awful lot of both money, time, and effort. And the question becomes, how focused is that? Um, is this a series of one-offs, or is this a real dedicated stream of assets that are really, as is the other portion of the institutions across the P20 system, are they all dedicated um, in uniform manner to the same sort of outcomes? So, yes, you would still have the availability of being able to go out and do the one-offs, no one's stopping that, but it is asking people to connect with organizations that have a real raison d'etre in the same body of work that uh, we are in, and thus leveraging their resource, their asset, their focus, their after-school programming, their, their uh, mission, if you will, um, to some of this work would be uh, an extraordinary asset. I've met with a number of these agencies who not only feel as though we have not asked them at the table, but feel that in many instances being asked to the table is a function of who they get to talk to. In other words, there are some di some districts that say, yes, come on in, we'd love to have you talk and be our, be our partner, and other districts who say, no, I'm not particularly interested, we don't have a problem. And uh, what I'm suggesting is, is that the state is under-leveraged when it comes to how we use our own money and, the, if you will, the assets of the outside community-based organizations, and I think we ought, to, we ought to find a way of connecting those dots. Last, and certainly not least, the element of this um, that I think is going to be critical is the notion that this would be essentially a pilot year for those who are in any way, shape, or form interested in being able to do this. I would not recommend and will not be recommending to OAIB or anybody else that this be something we immediately make a full course shift to, but rather that we ultimately see this as a, an opportunity to move in the right direction, but move in that direction, if you will, by virtue of learning our way um, and going forward uh, and changing and growing as, as we do so. Um, again, you'd still have the benefit of the uh, current structure of compacts as they currently sit. We'd still be living by those same deadlines, those same timelines. So, uh, uh, Chairperson Curtis, to, the, to your question of, you know, how then would this ultimately lay out for direction giving to the rest of the state, I would simply say the rest of the state is going to be stay, stay on course. This is exactly what we understand this to be and uh, the compacts as we get the metrics uh, more sorted out and exactly correct and that's going to be exactly what we would do. I do have some more comments about some of the things that were talked about in your, in your uh, items of uh, recommendation but nonetheless um, assuming notwithstanding that I, I would still want to have us go forward in that. But this actually portends what the future looks like, right? This is, a, this is a way of doing what I was saying to you, of sort of looking where the puck is going to be. 
And that what we actually have to do is start thinking about ways by which we leverage our asset as institutions with outside communities, look, look for ways by which we get ourselves into the envelope of the real content specific bodies of work that we know young people are going to have to do. Um, understand the narrative. It was talked about at a number of community colleges that they've got their, there's a huge narrative out there that we're in some ways not necessarily always able to embrace in the current compact language and, and structure. And so embrace that language, get that narrative in there, allow people to be unique creators of their own answers to their problem set within the region, um, um, but do so by virtue of asking them to define it and then talk specifically about how and what resources would be dedicated to it. So the purpose of this, uh, this, this pilot year, if you will, would be to identify a number of sites throughout the, throughout the state, a number of locations uh, that are actually piloting this. I don't have in mind at this point what a particular number would look like, um, but really looking for people to actually, you know, sort of get together, meet in this regional uh, notion um, and give us the data points that we need for being able to improve the system as we go forward. So that's it. Um, uh, by way of time frame, um, I would say to you it's my intent to have this information before uh, this body in full, in full measure uh, uh, for the next OEIB meeting um, in January. Um, it would be my intent to then have it come forward to, to the next meeting after coming through this committee um, and, uh, and hopefully getting the, uh, the recommendation and blessings of this group. Um, and certainly by the time that happens and all of the data points and all the things that happened in the prior conversation uh, are finalized, either today or tomorrow as it relates to K-12, uh, then, um, then I believe then it would be a full, a full presentation to the, uh, to the board um, at the next meeting in January, in, January. in January. So the next committee meeting in January, which will precede. Will, okay. It precedes okay. the board right. meeting. Right. right. Well, as one who's very active in the social service community, this is very exciting because oftentimes the discussions that we have and the work that we do with the children and families is how can we impact what's happening happening in education. If we were to regionalize the effort, and the word I like is integrate the work that we're doing because it isn't so much leveraging as much as it is really recognizing the contributions that we all bring to the table on behalf of children, which is what this finally begins to get at. Uh, we've, We've all done our work extraordinarily well, but we've all done it very much in silos, and it hasn't been in the best interest of the child. The way I would see this, the outcome, would be that suddenly Oregon would become a child-centered mm -hmm. state, mm -hmm. and all of our efforts would be mm -hmm. in that direction. Mm -hmm. So I think this is very exciting. We love the fact that you finally came to pilot. I think because it's pretty big, uh, but I think um, <laughs> for demonstration, however we want to frame it, I think there will be a lot of uh, a lot of interest in moving in this direction. But we've talked about it as an ESD, and people got excited. We've talked about it with the community college and university. We do regular meetings, and everyone's excited. So. Um, we really do our united way in their birth to sex work. This really fits in. So, and I think this really helps things. You know, like Fulham says, it's not top down or bottom up. It's a combination. This really takes policy and lets right. lets the people in the regions really create it in a way that they're accountable, but it's unique for their region. It's exciting. Do you see it as uh, if if a region were to do the pilot? Are individual districts or community colleges still doing their own achievement compact, or is it all based on the, the regional compact? Um, I, I would say that the um, uh, that they all, and this is the way the law is currently situated. So I would say that they each have to do their own compact, but what they submit is a regional compact. They submit one. Which has those which metrics has those in metrics in it. So there's two levels he's suggesting. One well, has the metrics. Right. So so so, so what, what I'm what I'm what I'm saying is that first of all, if 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 they were to be a region, I would want to read their compact across the spectrum of the P twenty world. Right? So that's what I'd be looking at. I'd be looking at data points that touch each spectrum of each child across the P20 world. As a region, but not as, as a, an individual district. 
Um, uh, yes, yes, yes. Because ultimately, ultimately, what I'm what I'm hopeful of is that we begin to roll districts work and community college work into the same sort of um, construct as the way by which we are trying to actually treat them. The second we have 10 through 14 new structure, you all of a sudden have a very different rollout. Now, now I, but I do think for right now, for right now, just to keep the, 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 the structure right, I do think right now you, you've got to actually ask districts to do theirs in the same place, in the same journey, if you will, as community colleges and higher education, so that they're not, we're not in the habit of being able yet to think and act organically. I'd like to say that I think we are, and everybody can just, you know, do it on their own, and, and they'll just send me one thing, but what I have is, at that point, I have no confidence that everybody is all, all is everybody's going to be in the same room, they're going to have had the conversation, somebody can't come, somebody didn't sign off, what are boards going to then agree to, what, what would your board then be saying yes to, which is currently the requirement of law now, and so on and so forth. So I just think right now, to keep it a little bit more simple, I would be asking everybody, just do your thing, but do it. If you're going to be a pilot, do it in the context of a, uh, of, of a region, and, and give me from the region... Give me your contact. And because this is a process, for instance, we did this at the ESD where we brought in 19 districts and normed a region where, normed it as uh, a region. Mm -hmm. And so right. when you right. think of the trajectory, so the ESD compact we submitted was a normed 19 district compact. Right. You could do that. Right. With pre-K, you do the same exercise. What you're doing is you're you're not telling people they have to do it. You're asking who wants to play, who wants to pilot, who wants to innovate and think outside the box as a student centered in a region. Right. Which means you have to give up a little control here. Well. But which you know, I mean, but that it can be done. Yeah. It can be done really where it's normed for a region. So pre K through. If I may, just yeah. to, to respond. Um, I, I totally agree, Mark. I totally agree that that can it can be done. I just wasn't sure, to be perfectly honest with you, how much of a reach to make from the conundrum that we're in right now with, hey, give me the give me the data. What are the data points? Da da da. da to all the way to that. So I was trying to take that actually in steps. If there are people who say to me, listen, I'm ready to do it right now, which I do think in case of uh, where was it, Hilda? Well, it would have been Lynn Benton. Lynn Benton. Benton. Uh, yeah, we're doing right now. Right? There are a couple of places that I would say are pretty, pretty advanced in being able to do this right now, and they've been already in it for some period of time. That's their advantage, right? right? Um, the um, the thing that I wanted to maintain was that there needed to be a way where, when you see an outlier, mm -hmm. right? When you see the outlier, the outlier is the providence, if you will, of the region. Right, you got to take issue with that. So on the issue of accountability, that's that's as my father used to say that's y'all's problem, yeah. right? Yeah. You 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 are the ones who have to take issue with that. I would be looking at the data from the standpoint of, you know, where are you in the region and who is on the down who's on the downside of variation from your norms. When you talk about your norms from a region, so who's on the down look at kids and who's there right. and whose kids they are. Right, right, right. So then I was, what I was trying to do was to get out of this business of, you know, who are you to come in here and, and, and dictate to us about local control and on and on. And I mean, I, believe me, I've had it up to here with all of that already. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, that was never the intent anyway. I don't believe it was the intent of the board overall. I mean, I really don't think that that was where it was. But I know that that's the road you go down the second you start talking about this stuff and doing it with some clarification, some clarifying data about this isn't good enough. So I would still be in the business of looking at districts and looking at community colleges, looking at universities, whomever, and saying, you know, this isn't good enough, or this is great, this is an, you know, this is one. I'd still be in that business of looking at that, but I'd be looking at it through the lens, really, of an entire region and having the people in the region are the people that I would, instead of going to that district. So think about the power if you to say, kindergarten is, the KRA is one outcome, third grade is one outcome, we, middle, one indicator, 
ninth grade transition high school, and the, then we merge in the higher ed with the AA completion, whatever we do, four year, yeah. and you do cohorts, and it's cohort data, and you track kids in your region. And I got corrected at a meeting this week, ready at CCO. We can't just say birth anymore. It's got to be prenatal. <laughs> So I said, this is really, so we've got to count those three-fourths of a year in this conversation now, too, of prenatal. She really dinged me hard. But anyway, you think about that. You track kids in the region at those outcomes, and you own the kids in the region. That's a completely different conversation. Here's, the, here's, the, here's my only pushback about this, and I, I'm these, you know, honest about it as I can. I don't see any evidence that there are children, that there are, I think that there is a mounting body of evidence that there have been large numbers of children who have not been owned by anybody in this state for a very long time. So I don't have a lot of confidence, to be honest with you, Mark, that just shifting automatically to a quote-unquote regional compact automatically transitions people's capacity or will to take responsibility for kids that they've never taken responsibility for ever, ever before. Now, I understand that's a big statement, and I'm not trying to be, again, in any way... Um, overly caustic about it, but I am saying to you, when I, you know, there's just no amount of data that I, I keep looking at that if there was if there was a day that people were going to take take quote unquote collective responsibility for groups of kids who heretofore were falling off of the the trajectory, that would have happened. Like that would have happened a long time ago. There would be a structure, there would be an infrastructure, there would be policy, there would be programs, there would be a practice, there would be a use of research, and so on and so forth. I just don't see that. So that's why if you hear me being a little reticent about saying, hey, listen, this is great, let's everybody go to this, it's, 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 it's not without some level of accountability. It's not going to be without some level, some measure of you know, my office having my hand on the data that I'm always going to reserve the right to say, you know what, this is not good enough, this is not right. You can't do this, you can't do that, whatever it may be. Again, and I understand what all that means in this state, but I just don't want us to think that just simply a new structure means a new heart. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. An example of that is uh, that this is the first time for some districts that publicly they had to disaggregate and set a goal around those disaggregated groups. It's, it's similar to that issue of uh, those outlier Hmm. non-performing not only groups of kids but schools or districts within a community college region and I think because we're so diverse as a state in some places it's very complicated like I could imagine Portland Community right. College for example is a great example um, districts like mine might get lost not not just sub, uh, not just the district or the schools but even the subgroups of kids within those where as a region for example you could look like you're doing really well on that compact but again my district could still be way over here because we're small we don't have as much resource so not only do the demographics look different and the size look different but the resource level um, just using our community college reason as an, as an example there are some districts that I just was recently in a conversation where the superintendents were saying so what's our budget process going to look like? And, you know, we're almost out of reserves. And I'm thinking, I've been out of reserves for four years, so I can't even be a part of this conversation. So there's so many differences. That's the only thing that I would worry about. And it seems like we don't yet have enough experience yet to describe how we would be careful about so that. So we go with those that are ready to do it. Right. So I think there are some who would be, and maybe that's part of the narrative, is they explain how they're not going to lose track of those I think. We're individually accountable to like, I would be zero of the 12. I, I think the parents in my community need to see that, but we're collectively accountable and invested in zero to 20. And I think, you know, you could, like you say, there's some mutuality about that. The other thing that's real exciting to me is kind of like the professional learning community. You know, I think about community colleges in my area have been better than we have around using technology online courses. We, have, through response to intervention, yes. now have all our special ed kids in, in regular classes yes. surrounded by structures. So we could help in that way. And you know, I think together we can really share a practice that's really going to cause better practice across the pathway. I, I would say one other thing that is, you know, as I've 
talked with Hilda and met with a number of private university presidents and others, um, there's plenty of room in this for their uh, hand, if you will, and their involvement um, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way, whether it be specifically about research. I think there's an awful lot of body of work around teacher development and teacher support. Uh, as the governor uh, holds on to these um, uh, initiatives going through the system, there's a lot of really good value, if you will, in being able to figure out what, what bang did, for the buck did we get in this region over that region and why, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I, I think that there's a, a whole new role, if you will, in, that, in this configuration for the private uh, uh, universities uh, within the state to, to play a, an incredibly important part, and they too should be in should be thought of as people who are going to be in the in the compact. And they so. reached out and they reached out to be a part of forty forty point. They made yeah. that clear. You know, already, and in, 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 in this is probably typical of many others in the room. Uh, whether it's a hub meeting, whether it's a CCO meeting, it's the same conversation, and. To me, the idea of the regional compact, if we were to limit the number of metrics within it, mm -hmm. and we were also to get other wraparound services to align to some of those metrics. I mean, I've talked to folks in DHS and said, why can't you have third grade reading as one of your indicators for success? Mm -hmm. And part of the problem we talk silos in Oregon is they all have their own outcomes, their own accountability system, and then they're fearful of stepping outside the box, getting their hands slapped. This, a regional compact might be an opportunity too, besides the narrative, to start piloting and redefining metrics outside of education. Meaning that DHS, the KRA, is one of your measurements. Well, nonprofits can play an important role. But that's the reason for the happen. second layer yeah. of the compact itself. Yeah. It, it is it is about community um, partners and and helping them to actually organize their resources around not as you said not necessarily just participating but actually integrating into the work. You see, with a regional, there's now a door open to do that. That before it's you have. Well, 197 school districts, how do you align to that? How do you align to 17 community colleges? But now there's a door open that we can, have to, we can sit down in the region and really look at what are we going to measure to own these kids prenatal. And then there's another level. You know, there's the whole foundation community or the community yeah. of funders right. who get to the table in this yeah. conversation to say that our funding is going to be dictated by everybody moving in this direction. I mean, I think it's, a, it's an exciting opportunity. If there's not any more comments of the committee specifically, I guess I would like to think about next steps. Um, I know you mentioned bringing a very clearly articulated public document to the next meeting in, in January. So my question, you want to add something? As Mike and I were talking to you, in addition, we can bring a set of, um, you know, uh, how we might proceed it with respect to the current law and the rules, you know, whether or not there could be some flexibility um, from the current um, compact given to those pilot districts and how that would actually flush out in operation. Okay, Mon, I'm probably going to open up a huge can of worms, but there are okay. a couple of things I was hoping we could walk out of here with today or at least have a timeline and next steps. Okay. With. The districts are dying on the vine about February. We need, and uh, people need an answer quickly. Now, whether that's a decision we need to make today or we're going to delegate that to Rudy, I don't know. But we need to walk out of here clearly on what are the next several months coming to districts. Second thing is, are we, the, the regional achievement contacts excite the heck out of me, but what would the timeline be to grow what's needed for people to make that commitment? I don't, that's, that's not overnight. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is the metrics. We have a recommendation here. Uh, are we to the point where we're going to hold to the metrics of last year? You know, Rudy, you talked about that. Are we going to move that forward and make changes within individual ones? And are we going to make individual or changes in the ones that would be a regional? So there's a whole lot of rambling there, but I'm hoping we could get some next steps with that. 
Okay, so b before we get to the next steps, let me tell you how I was thinking about this um, in relation to these three items. Mark, you just put on the table the metrics question. I don't think we're prepared to make a decision today about the metrics. Okay, so I think we are therefore by indecision making a decision that the metrics that we have for right now until otherwise solidified, those metrics go as they are, as they were rather. Okay. Um, I am open to and willing to quickly convene a small body of this group to sit down and build those metrics and so that they get baked anew into the new, uh, if you will, conventional compacts going forward. So if I, if, if I had, you know, mm -hmm. a small group here, we could agree on that. I just don't think this committee is going to be able to do that today, right? Um, but I think you could do that by the end of the week, right? Secondly, um, with respect to the recommendations that I'm going to be putting forward relative to the compact, uh, uh, the, the regional compact, um, I wanted to share the idea here, um, assuming it meets with your conceptual approval, then I would go back and build the recommendations that Whitney and Mike are already uh, working on, and I would bring that to the next uh, OEIB meeting, and the dates for the regional compact pilot, if you will, would be different dates than if they, they would be different dates. They, they couldn't be the, the February and so on and so forth. They would be triggered differently, right? There would be a whole rollout. It would be almost like an RFP where people can say, hey, I'm in and, and, and so on. But the, the dates would be very, very different. They'd be more generous, frankly, right? Um, uh, I, I don't know, and Whitney and others would have to help me with whether, you know, what the latitudes are in changing the current structure dates. I don't think we have the ability to do that because they're set by law. But, you know, at least what we have is what we have. And I would be saying... Let's 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 operate on the on the assumption that that's what is, with the exception of the metrics, which I, as I say, I'm open to, to, to looking at. But as a smaller group here, um, that's the only change that I would see. The dates of that, the timeline of that, is exactly the pressures of it, are all what we would keep for right now. I wouldn't see that necessarily changing in any other way other than the metrics themselves. So I just want to clarify because I heard you say originally for number one that the metrics would go as they were in the current compact already, but I'm hearing you say that you would consider possibly some other metrics or some clarification as uh, aligned yeah. with maybe. Let me say it this way: barring agreement on what the new metrics would be, okay. then we are going to have the old metrics. Okay. Okay. I, think that I am more than willing to have an openness to looking at these metrics and the recommendations that the committee has, has brought forward, and I want time to do that. Right. So trying to make a decision right here, right now, to me just doesn't make, for me personally, wouldn't make sense. I mean, I just wouldn't be, I'm not prepared to do that. Okay. But if I have a small group, I sit down, I could do it by the end of this week, and we'd have the, you know, recommendation out and circle back, give everybody on the committee a copy of, of what that recommendation is give you a chance to, you know, ask me and answer any questions if you'd like, but ultimately let's get on with it. So in your view, we would maybe, once that decision is made, we could go ahead and roll that guidance out to districts without having to come back to this committee, Correct. as long Correct. as you're sort of getting thumbs up from this committee to go ahead and do Correct. that. I'd like to see us do that. It's okay. yeah. Just real quick, I see Colin has a question. Does that yeah, I'm help put my, my district committee uh, hat on that we just formed three months ago. And we're waiting. We we have a February report due. We don't know what it is. We have not received the, the directions, the template from the state as promised, and we need. We're feeling anxious. It's uh, December. This is due first of February, which means we probably have about three working weeks to get anything done. We form the committee. We're waiting to know what the February report is. So if if you could think about what is the nature of that February report. The danger, I think, out there is if we if we don't say we're going to have the level one or the district compacts as is, and we're we're going forward, we may tweak a few things, but that's in place. What people will hear is we're going to do regional compacts, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Oh, now we're going to go regional compacts. So I think the message has to be really careful here. 
Yeah. And I understand the evolution piece, but but uh, they're the local folks right now are thinking, what are we turning in February? Yeah, that's that's the question. What yeah. what is February? What is February? And if, if that needs if you can make a decision to postpone that or give direction real soon on what that'll be, you know, it's a narrative report on your progress so far, so be it. But they're waiting and they're and they're, there's some frustration out there. And part of the problem too is they need to go to their boards in January to get that done yeah, in February. Exactly. And that's that's another one. So I really like the idea of what you're throwing out that those who want to get together this week, we knock that out, we define February, we def knock out whether we make those changes. Mm -hmm. I, I like that idea yeah. a lot. So I guess I'd like to just check with this committee, um, just kind of a thumbs up. Are we okay with going ahead to saying to uh, Dr. Cruz department and whatever small group you might pull together to say go ahead and take these recommendations and figure out if there will be any changes and then come out with a report that is direction and guidance to districts about what we expect them to be taking to their boards by February. Right, right. That's so, exactly right. Yeah. Any opposition to that? Okay. Could I ask and my chair? clarifying oh, question? Sure. Are there any elements on the list that you all brought forward around the metrics that don't fall under the con the message that I think you said about that these are already available data points? So well, of course the care timeline, notwithstanding that, that that doesn't change, none of those suggested changes to the metrics would be impacted. They could all be incorporated into the f February. Except the KRA because we don't yeah, have it yet. Yeah, except that one. If it's available. And what about the year one retention OUS? We have to, that would post that would be a time later. frame on that one. Yeah. So that might be one that we don't okay. change. Right. But that's the reason for going in a small okay. group and really looking yeah. at this. Yeah. Um, what, I would, what I would want the uh, chair to be aware of is that um, both Mike uh, Selig and, uh, and Whitney Grubbs are, are going to be the point people um, okay. for this. And so if there's someone from the committee that you'd like to uh, nominate or self-nominate or however you want to do that, but just ultimately if you want someone to work with them for the purpose of being able to uh, come back with this, it would really sort of be a by Friday. Okay. Uh, Is there anyone who wants to volunteer? I'd be glad to do that if you're willing to do it over the phone or computer. And, and I'd be interested in seeing where you're going. Um, Again, I don't have a lot of availability, so it'd have to be over the phone as well. So if there's a way to find, but I'm good if you go with Mark. I think we've talked about these enough that I support the direction you go. I just like to see it before we go out. Okay, Mark and I will work with you on that. Uh, the next one I'd like to ask this committee is: um, Do we have a, a thumbs up for the conceptual idea of the regional? Compact going out as a pilot with possibly more flexibility around timelines and clearly some narrative that is evidence of, of that region working together for all kids. Just don't know me that I should mention as well that in the governor's recommended budget is some funding for the regional compact convening idea to bring together the, the groups and actually you know, do a thoughtful process of figuring out how this would work and what the Information about money is always money. good. No, <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, committee members? So this is with individual accountability and then group accountability. Yes, I'm hearing yes. what you yes. say. For this yes. first time, we'll still have the individual accountability that we right. kind of owe that to our our districts, agencies. Okay? I agree. Thumbs up. All right. Um, so... That was kind of one and two rolled together, and then number three. Did we get you what you need yes, to move sir. forward? Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, ideas or things that you want to bring up? I know we still have conversation to have around the community college yes. metrics, and I know that uh, David is interested in hearing about the regional and being a part of that, but we'll have more of that conversation. I'm glad it's you brought that up. So college. this little work group we're going to have this week, that's K-12? That's K-12. So that's not CC? No. no. My understanding is there's commu community college work going on behind the scenes. We'll hear more about that in January, along with furthering this conversation about the regional compact. 
But what we won't need to talk about again is the K-12 metrics, because right. that information will have already gone out. And just for clarification for this little work, work group as well, what our outcome is going to be is recommendations on the metrics and a timeline and an answer on what February means. Correct. Yes. Got it. Correct. Okay. Any other questions, thoughts around this topic or anything else members of the committee want for next January? In the next year, 2013. Well, if I may. Sir. One of the conversations that I think is, is really significant in the context of this is um, uh, the issue of um, uh, the report cards and their and the, and, the, and the sort of interface of report cards and compacts. Yes. And I think it ought to be a different. I mean, that's a different conversation. Um, I have some thoughts about that, but I'd like to. I'd like to make sure that we have that for our for a meeting. If it's if it's not January, then then soon thereafter. But. <laughs> and I know they're in the middle of uh, doing focus groups. Do you know the timeline on the report card group? And we um, might have something to share. I think they'll have their preliminary recommendations in February, I believe. But we could. We're we're getting a briefing from them this week, and we and we can touch base with you about whether maybe if it makes sense, they they could come to a, a sort of update in January. So um, I would appreciate if Dr. Crew and myself and whoever else in the department is working on on that, if maybe we could do a conference call to see where we are and where it intersects sure. our work. And it, would it be possible to have just whatever you can get information from them for our meeting, before our meeting? Mm -hmm. I mean, where, 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 where we're going, I mean, is where we felt last year. We felt like we had our arm tied behind our back because we could never figure out what the, goes in the compact and what goes in over here. So the compact became much larger than we envisioned. We've been saying let's get the two crosswalked, and if we're meaning to you know, roll things out here then this week, it'd be nice to have whatever we have. Even if it's just an update on where they are in the process, because that might be what it is. Yeah, they're not. They're not to the stage of recommendations. No, yet. because I think they're still holding focus groups in January. Yeah. I think is what. Yeah. My, my my question is a tad bit different. My question yeah. is, what's the vision? What's the vision okay. around around the use of compacts, the use of report cards, and then these just become tools to carry that vision out? Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So, in, 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 you know, I, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, we don't want to have this conversation about accountability, and we don't want to have this conversation about, you know. Um, uh, how all of that lays out. I, I, the way I've looked at these is essentially this is almost like, you know, a hard data research, clinical, you know, uh, and, and sort of soft data, right? And so, but they come under the umbrella, the philosophical umbrella of a mutual accountability system, mm -hmm. right? And the question becomes, how do you use hard data, right. <laughs> and how do you use soft data, and you know who generates it, and what can you do about it, and so on and so forth. So the, it just seems to me like this isn't really that hard. It's more the language that is unfortunately kind of peppering some of this that makes it feel like you know. And you're so right that the conversation has really ultimately kind of grown out of this sense of we got to throw it all all into this question, all into this bucket of the, of the, of the compacts and, you know, simplification went out the door and it, it, we should make this simple and we should make it clear and we should make it a straight line with, you know, all the policy questions being answered as to what happens if. I think we've heard that from many entities and that is get clear about what those pieces are and how that all works together. And more is less. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've less is more. Yeah. Less is more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we knew what you meant. We know what you meant. <laughs> we walk around, I did a four hour trip. Maybe you can follow me around for every other mistake I make in the next four hours. But uh, I have heard and, and agree with it that, you know, what get, what, you know, you put down, what gets measured gets done. Yeah. 
And when we just made this bucket last year, it really lost the essence. And Rudy, what I hear you saying is, you know, the compact, what we defined it as, it's a visionary document. It's, it's, it's meant to get a different conversation. That's what excites me. I think we can do it right with the regional ones. But let's fix and address and right now, when we have the measurements and the degree of cells that we have, it's gotten away from being a meaningful document. Now, what I don't want is the district's just going through another practice here in February, and this is an opportunity to catch that. Great. Anything else? All right, I'm going to adjourn us.